The phrase perception is reality is in many cases anything but reality when it comes to Asian American men and women. The stereotype that Asian American men are math geeks and their female counterparts are submissive China dolls is challenged by Yul Kwan. We discuss overcoming stereotypes about Asian Americans to find success in the real world on Newsmakers. Perhaps the most pervasive stereotype of Asian Americans is that they're hardworking, highly educated, successful professionals, and tech savvy. There are less flattering portrayals found in American media, TV shows, and the silver screen. Yul Kwan is a Korean American who knows a little bit about this portrayal back in 2006. He was the winner of the CBS reality show Survivor Cook Islands. It was the season the network decided to divide tribes by ethnicity. Mm -hmm. You survived. You were the sole survivor. I survived. I, yeah, I did it. Uh, that selection process yeah. um, and the pitch to you to do this, mm -hmm. how do, I mean, obviously you decided to do it, but when it was first pitched to you, what was your, what was your first reaction and what did you have to think about before making that decision? Well, interestingly enough, they asked me to be on the show. Uh, I didn't apply. I, I got recruited because they needed more Asian Americans to be on the show and you don't get a lot of Asian Americans applying to be on reality shows. But they didn't tell us about the racial twist until the game started. So we were already on the island and like the night before everything kicks off, they take us aside one by one and they said, hey, by the way, there's going to be kind of a twist to the season that we haven't told you about. We're going to divide you by race. And when they told me, I was just like, no, you're, you're joking. You got to be kidding. I mean, that just sounds like such a bad idea. Uh, but they were serious about it. And for me, I, I really had to make a decision on whether I wanted to go through with something that I thought just had enormous potential to do harm. Um, but in the end, I realized that, hey, you know what, the show's going to run on even without me. At least if I'm on the show, I have the ability to influence how the game plays out and how we're portrayed on, on national television. Why did you think it was a bad idea? I just thought that there's so many different ways this could turn out with a bad ending. I mean, what if one ethnic race ends up wiping out all the other races? In fact, on our season, it seemed like at one point that the Caucasian tribe was going to wipe out all the people of color on, on the show. Not because they were racist, but because that's just the way the game was starting to play out. And, you know, at, during the season itself, you had a lot of white supremacist groups making comments about how the whites were dominating and yada, yada, yada. And I just thought that, you know, there were many different ways this could play out, and most of them were bad. What did you make of that? I mean, it's interesting you, you talked about like the commenters and people out there. There's a lot of that, right? It seems like anytime you read any any news item and there are comments afterwards, mm -hmm. it usually, you know, disintegrates into race or politics yeah. or something else. What, it, what does that tell you just about society itself? It's interesting. Like I'm, you know, I'm a big proponent of free speech. I think that's something, one of the pillars of our, of our society. There's something about the anonymity, I feel like, of the internet at times where people just can write the worst things about each other. I mean, you'll read a very intelligent article written by uh, a professor, and the comments that you'll read afterwards just, again, degenerate down to like the lowest common denominators. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I believe in the power of mass media to really reach a broader audience than you could through any other media. And I feel like, at least on the show, that one season we were ultimately able to tell a very positive story about racial diversity. Because what I really try to do is not so much try to win by myself, but to try to create a multi-ethnic coalition that worked together without lying, cheating, or stealing and got to the end by playing with integrity. Did that break down the stereotypical walls as you're playing this game? Did some of the stereotypes play out? I mean, what did, what did you learn about the different groups as you were banding together? I mean, I, I learned at the end of the day what I think anyone learns if they're working and exposed to people of different ethnic backgrounds. We're all human beings. We have the same motivations. We, we care about the same things. We all bleed. Um, and all, at the end of the day, it's your individual personality that trumps everything else, including race and ethnicity. You're in town, uh, you'll be speaking at Grand Valley State University, and your lecture, I think, is just interesting. It's Beyond Math Geeks and China Dolls. Yep. Uh, those are two of the biggest stereotypes of the Asian population, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, so it gets people's attention right away. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, some of the pervasive influences that I saw when I was a kid. Um, my parents immigrated to this country back in 1970. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. So a lot of what my parents did to just kind of occupy our time was to have us watch television. And television was both 
an inspiring influence in my life, as well as a, a, a very constraining one. It was inspiring in the sense that, you know, I watched a lot of PBS. I watched a lot of Sesame Street, Electric Company, Nova. And from these things, I learned how to speak English. I learned how to count. I, I learned to aspire to become something more than what I would have otherwise thought I could be. On the other hand, it was constraining in the sense that, like, I didn't see a lot of Asian Americans on television. And when I did, they were typically portrayed according to negative stereotypes. And so most of my life, I just didn't think I could ever be a leader. I always thought that look, Asian American guys are supposed to be geeks. We don't get dates. We're not athletes. You know, we're not sexy. We're not articulate. We're not charismatic. Uh, we just work really hard. And I felt like the influence of television played a very key role in the way that I looked at myself and defined my relationships with other people. And it wasn't until I got much, much older that I was able to recognize that and try to overcome it. So what I'm hoping to talk about today is just talk about, again, the influence of television, the limitations as well as the potential, and how I think we can work to overcome some of the stereotypes that apply not to just my ethnic community, but across all communities, um, and try to get to a place where race, ethnicity don't define you. How harmful are those stereotypes? I think they can be quite harmful. I mean, obviously, if you have a very negative stereotype, then people will prejudge you and, and don't give you the opportunities that you need in order to demonstrate your potential. Even the supposedly positive stereotypes, like for Asian Americans, uh, what we call the model minority myth, the belief that like we're all doing well, we do uh, extraordinarily well in, in school, you know, we get good jobs, all that kind of stuff. On the super surface, that seems like a positive thing. But it also masks other negative stereotypes that are basically joined at the hip. For example, Asian Americans are generally supposed to be good at math and they work really hard. But at the same time, they're seen as being poor communicators. They don't have leadership potential. So what you're seeing this play out in the real world is that Asian Americans go to good schools and they get, in, uh, get good jobs at entry level positions across a number of companies. But you rarely see Asian Americans getting to the top. They hit a barrier, and we call it the bamboo ceiling, because we're always perceived as being good worker bees, but not people who can lead the organization. Why is that? I think it's a combination of stuff. Um, there was a Harvard Business School study that uh, looked into this phenomenon, and they found a, a range of issues that are both internal and external. On the internal side of it, a lot of Asian Americans tend to shy away from self-promotion. Um, they tend to work really hard in the belief that merit will get them to the top. But they're not very good at building kind of the broader network of mentors and relationships that they need in order to get farther ahead in society. Um, there are also external factors. The belief that Asian Americans, again, aren't good leaders. And it's a reinforcing stereotype because if I don't think you're going to be a good leader, I'm not going to put you in positions where you're going to grow as a leader or demonstrate your leadership potential. And that ends up confirming the stereotype. So I think there are, you know, a broad set of factors that come into play. Um, there are these factors that apply to Asian Americans, but every ethnic group also deals with their own unique set of uh, circumstances and stereotypes that limit their potential. How much is cultural? Uh, you, were, you were born in the States, yeah. so you were born an Asian American. Is there a difference if you're a transplant, if you come to the States? Is there a difference that maybe you have closer ties with the culture of the native land? Does that... I think for all American communities, you know, they, they, fa they face a similar set of challenges. Like on one hand, they come in, they're seen as outsiders, and to the extent they try to broaden outside of their, their kind of immigrant community, they're often um, chastised by people within the community because they see you as becoming whitewashed or someone who's trying to forget about your ethnic roots. At the same time, you know, just locking yourself into your own insular that your own enclave isn't a recipe for becoming successful in, in a transplanted society. In my own case, I've, I've definitely noticed how my cultural upbringing impacted the way that I behaved and the way that other people saw me. And the, the story I often give is, um, you know, in college I went to uh, Officer Canada School for the Marine Corps. I just thought like, hey, you know, I got the studying thing down, but I need to do something to challenge myself. And one day I got a flyer in the mail and joined the Marine Corps. I'm like, yeah, why not? Um, and I went there just mainly to see if I could do it, because, you know, Officer Canada School for the Marine Corps is known as being one of the hardest boot camps in the country. And when I got there, I really struggled. You know, I couldn't rely on anything that I'd learned or had been taught in the past. People actually, like, made fun of me because they thought I was too educated, right? And the, the key moment where I realized um, that my cultural influence really impacted my behavior happened when I was standing sentry duty outside the base. Now, I'd always worked hard my entire life. I knew that I was a good worker. But when I was standing out there, you know, the major of the base comes walking by, and I totally freaked out. And you know, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to salute him. But instead of saluting him, I bowed. <laughs> <laughs> the commander's like, 
Kid, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> why did you just bow to me? I was like, sir, this candidate does not know why this candidate just bowed to, to this sir. And I just kind of like flubbed. He was like, all right, give me like 100 push-ups. So I'm sitting there doing push-ups. I'm thinking to myself, why the hell did I just bow to this guy? Like, no one ever taught to me that you're su supposed to bow in the Marine Corps. And what I realized was that, you know, like all my life, I'd always been taught that in front of a social superior, you're supposed to bow and take a very submissive posture. You never raise your tone of voice. And in the Marine Corps, I was being criticized every day because they interpreted that as a lack of discipline. The way you're supposed to emulate behavior is you're supposed to stand up straight, stick your chest out. Someone asks you a question, you scream at the top of your lungs. And I just didn't know how to do that. And so what I realized was that, hey, you know, there are these behaviors that I learned ever since I was a kid, and I need to recognize these behaviors and to change them if I'm going to be successful in broader society. And I think that's something that a lot of people go through. So your parents. I mean, this was something from the household. Tell me about your parents. My parents were very, you know, traditional Korean parents. Um, my father uh, came from very humble means. My mother did as well. They always saw education as the, the stepping stone to success. And so they pushed my brother and, and me to study very, very hard. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think my mom was a very good counterbalance. Um, if it was up to my father, I think we never would have played sports. We probably would never have dated. Uh, we probably wouldn't have a lot of fun. My mom was kind of the opposite extreme. And so I think between the two, we ended up having a good balance of parenting skills that allowed us to become both disciplined as well as well-rounded. So did you have a rebellious state? I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure this out because you are a leader. You're, you're every, you, you break so many of the stereotypical molds. I'm trying to figure out when was that moment in your life when you decided, you know, things are going to be a little bit different here for me? I, yeah, I, I did try to break out of my own way. Like, I remember in college I got, like, earrings and I dyed my hair yellow one day. Um, the way that I tried to break away from some of the traditional kind of um, conventional routes uh, that are often impressed by Asian Americans. You know, going to the Marine Corps was just something that my parents absolutely hated. They didn't understand why I'd want to do that. Going on a reality show was something that... I thought was going to cause my father to disown me. <laughs> He's like, we spent all this time coming to this country, giving you a good education, and you're throwing away your whole career just to embarrass you know, yourself, your family, and Korean people all over the world by going on a stupid reality show. Um, even going into politics was not something that my parents supported, because back in Korea, politics was something that was seen as being very corrupt. But you know, the thing that I've been trying to tell my parents, that I encourage other young, young you know, Asian Americans and other minority students to tell their parents is that, hey, we have a set of opportunities that we're fortunate to have because of the sacrifices that you made. But at the same time, we have to take advantage of these opportunities to expand beyond, you know, surviving, expand beyond just having that good job, expand beyond doing something that actually has a broader impact on society. And I think that's something that my parents have slowly come to accept and support. What, what is, I don't know that you have a secret sauce here or anything, but is, is there something that you do recommend probably to anybody to be successful and to be the true you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there have been some uh, studies showing this, but the, the most important thing that you could probably do is to find a mentor. Mentorship is absolutely critical. Um, there was that one Harvard Business School study that found that uh, among all the Asian Americans who broke through the bamboo ceiling and made it to the top, um, the vast majority of them were able to find one mentor, one or two mentors, who made a pivotal difference at a critical stage in their careers. And I think that's the most important thing that you can do. Beyond that, I think the other thing is internally, you know, you have to put yourself, you have to be very, I think, introspective and be honest with yourself in terms of your weaknesses and your strengths. And I think the key is to commit yourself to a program to address those. When I was a kid, I suffered from crippling social anxiety disorders. I was bullied relentlessly, and that ended up having some severe psychological trauma that, le that stayed with me for many years, even well into my adulthood. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I started recognizing I need to do something to address these and to change. Otherwise, I'm never going to be someone that I can look at myself and be proud of. I'm never going to be happy. And so over time, I, I gave myself little challenges every day. Today, I'm going to raise my hand in class. Today, I'm going to introduce myself to someone new. Today, I'm going to you know, sign up for drama class, which would have just scared me you know, more than death when I was at a certain point in my life. Um, but it's those little challenges that you have to confront and those little successes that you can build on that over time can allow you to grow into someone that you otherwise couldn't be. I agree with that completely. Uh, Stanford, Yale Law School, still education has been uh, 
a cornerstone in yeah. your life? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think for the vast majority of people in this country, education is the the best way to find success. It's not it's not the right path for everyone. I mean, lots of people have found success outside of education. But again, education is something that you can't be taken away. Um, it will open doors for you. It won't make you happy. It won't necessarily guarantee success, but it will open doors for you. You'll have more options and a broader range of opportunities if you get a good education. And so I feel like for everybody, like one, it's something that's going to be practically important for you, but also having a good education just expands you as a person. The more that you know, the more that you learn, the more you learn about history and other things that people have done, the better informed you will be to make the right decisions for yourself. And you can break through those stereotypes yeah. as well. You talked about, you know, that there's a, there's a grain of truth in stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would mentioned there's a book that you're quoted in talking about groups that are stereotypically successful, Yeah. right? Um, so Amy Chua, who um, I'm sure you've heard of, is a Yale Law professor. She, she taught when I was at Yale, um, and we subsequently have become good friends. She wrote Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother a few years ago, which caused this huge uproar because people interpreted that book as saying that like the Chinese parenting style, which is very draconian, is better than Western parenting methods. She just came out with another book called The Triple Package, and this is equally controversial, I, I think, based on early press. Uh, but she's essentially making the claim that certain cultural groups, whether it's Mormons or Jews or Chinese or uh, Indians or Nigerians, um, are doing better than other cultural groups, and there are certain reasons why they're doing better. And she basically identifies three factors, what she calls a triple package. One is um, they have this superiority complex. They believe that they are destined for a better future than, than other groups. Two, they all at the same time paradoxically suffer from infer inferiority, where they feel like they're doing not as well as they should be doing. And the last one is, um, uh, basically delayed gratification. They're willing to control their impulses. Uh, it's been very controversial because people basically have not read the book and label, label her a racist. But I think, you know, her, her basic claim isn't really that controversial. It's a basic idea that certain behaviors um, tend to be promoted by certain groups and they tend to lead to certain types of success. So if you're looking just in terms of financial wealth or if you're looking at educational attainment, then things like hey, you know, I believe that I have a really high potential ceiling, and two, I'm not reaching that ceiling right now, and three, I need to work really hard and make investments now that will pay off down the road. Those are all things that I think are relatively uncontroversial. So you're quoted in the book. What was the question that she asked you? She, uh, so <laughs> I appear in the section on inferiority. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why that sucks? Oh, no, no, not inferiority. No, no, actually, I think I was on the insecurity part of it. <laughs> uh, but she was referencing, um, the story that I've told in the past, which is, again, when I was a kid, I had some real self-confidence issues, um, largely because I was bullied. And I think the point that she was making is that you can either let things like that beat you and define you, or you can use that as fuel to to push yourself and to achieve more than you otherwise could. And I don't know if I necessarily fit that, but I mean, I, I did feel that I do feel that a lot of the negative experiences I had when I was young were ones that ultimately I was able to leverage to make me a better person. It's interesting because, you know, in, in growing up in my neighborhood, there was a Taiwanese family that moved in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Sahutla Vangratana was the boy who was my age, yeah. and Haratha Vangratana was her, his younger sister. Mm -hmm. But they just went by tiger and bunny, which I don't know <laughs> if that was just an Americanization so that they could get through and maybe not be bullied. I don't know. But you know what? I was actually, uh, I was fascinated by tiger's intelligence. Yeah. I mean, he was such a smart kid and I, and in many ways I wish I, you know, I wish I could have been as smart as you. Now that's a stereotype and I'm sure that that was a, a culture in the household that education was very important but I mean he and I got along great but I was always fascinated by that and yeah. just how book smart and savvy he was. Yeah, yeah. I mean I think in any population you'll find really smart people and you'll find really like not smart people. I, I remember one of my good friends at Stanford um, believed that like Chinese were smarter than other people and I was like Hey, have you ever gone to China? Like, just gone there and like visited? And the average person. Yeah. yeah. He went there. And he came back. He's like, 
yeah, that's not <laughs> really right. that's the case. There are plenty of dumb people in China too, right? Um, but I do think that for a lot of immigrant populations, especially, um, there is that drive to succeed because you know I think for me as a second generation, I knew that my parents made enormous sacrifices. They could have had a much better life in Korea if they stayed there, but because they wanted to provide these opportunities for me and my brother, they gave up an enormous amount. And I always felt that. One, I have to honor that commitment, that investment that they made. And because my father had very high standards, I felt that I needed to set those, to achieve those standards. And I, so at the end of the day, I think what's important is to set expectations um, and give people the desire to succeed. And I think a lot of immigrant populations will have that. One, one interesting thing about Amy Chua's recent book, she also notes that like once you become fully acculturated, that advantage disappears. So if you look at Asian American students who are third generation, they don't do any better than everyone else. For you, I mean, you, you've tried just about everything in life. TV host, uh, you're a lawyer, yeah. uh, now you're working at Facebook. You also had a chance to work in government, in Joe Lieberman's office. Yeah. What was that experience like for you? That was pretty awesome. Um, I went to go work in government uh, right after September 11. You know, I, I really felt that call to service. And it was a terrible time in our nation's history, but in terms of actually working in D.C., it was an awesome time. Like, you know, Lieberman was a Democrat. Well, he was back then. But he had good relationships with John McCain and other Republicans. And there was a real sense of bipartisanship where it felt like the country was coming together. And we did a lot of really good work. We got a lot of really good bills passed on a bipartisan basis. Fast forward, I more recently went back to D.C. to work at the Federal Communications Commission. It was like night and day. I mean, as we all know, right now, government is a little bit paralyzed because of these hyper-partisan politics that just, you know, create this enduring gridlock where people just can't get anything done. And it's frustrating, you know. I, for me, I was at the FCC for about a couple of years and I just felt like I wasn't having the kind of broad-based impact that I wanted to have. And then I started thinking, hey, you know, where, where could I go where the organization has like a global reach, global footprint, but just moves much more quickly? And I was thinking, hey, it's like Facebook, right? I mean, no other organization or government in the world moves as quickly, but it impacts so many different lives. And so I figured, hey, if I want to have that kind of impact, I should probably go work there. And what are you doing there right now? Uh, I am currently the head of our privacy program. So privacy is a big issue that comes up, um, if not the biggest issue. And part of what I try to do is um, make sure that all of the products that we're developing are ones that have the user's privacy in mind. So how great is the cyber threat that's out there right now? Well, there's cyber threats going all over the place. Um, the, I think for the most part, I mean, we certainly do, and I think the government and you know, all the other companies out there do a pretty good job dealing with them. I mean, it's one of those things that you generally don't hear about all the successes. Right, you only hear about the things that got past all the different defenses and safeguards. Um, but it is a growing concern. I mean, the more that we become a connected society, a digital economy, the more you know, of our online, more of our personal information and data is out there for other people to potentially try to get against. But you know, at least at Facebook, we have some of the smartest people on the planet working there. And um, so far, I think we're doing a pretty good job. America Revealed. It was kind of a show about what makes America tick. Yeah. What did you enjoy about that experience? That was awesome. So America Revealed was this um, big mini-series um, that I hosted for PBS. And the basic idea was just, let's learn about the systems and the networks that make this country work. So we looked at, like, how does our food get to our plates? Like, where does our food come from? Uh, energy, where do we get our energy? How does it get distributed? Uh, manufacturing, how do we make things? And the last one was transportation. And for me, it was like a dream come true, because I get to geek out on all the stuff I like <laughs> to geek out on, but I get to travel around the country and, like, talk to all these cool people. Uh, it was awesome. What did you learn about the country, just getting out there and getting away from you know, the nest in California. Yeah, I, I learned to just appreciate the, the vast complexity of these networks that, that really keep our country humming along every day. Uh, at the same time, I've also learned that these complex networks can be very frail. You know, for example, back uh, about a decade ago, we had this massive blackout in the Northeast. And um, the reason why that happened was because someone forgot to trim a tree and the branch hit one of the electrical uh, transmission lines and it just had this cascading effect. So on one hand, you kind of learn about these beautiful networks that keep our country working. At the same time, you realize that a lot of them are getting over capacity and that some of them are reaching the breaking point. I know Facebook will want you for a long time, but big picture for you, what 
what do you see down the road? That's a good question. I, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Um, I feel like I've gotten to do a lot of, I, I feel like I've lived nine different lives and I feel very fortunate in that way. My next big thing is really just, you know, being a father. Like I traveled a lot when my first daughter was born filming America Revealed and I just want to spend a lot of time with my family. So I'm not sure professionally what I'm going to do. I can see myself going in different directions. But the one thing I do want to do is just be there for my kids. All right. Yul Kwan, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you ne next week.